Hello everybody, this is Kate Simpson. Hello everybody, this is Kate Simpson from Collaboration for Impact. You're in for a really special session today. I'm just watching as the numbers of attendees are um, cranking up as this webinar connects. We've got over 90 people registered and at the moment I think we've got 29 online. Some of those registered are overseas, so we know that they're probably registering um, to then listen to this broadcast after the event. And it's exciting. We've got people from uh, the UK, Canada and Singapore wanting to listen to this. And no wonder. Uh, Lisa McKenzie from Greater Shepparton Lighthouse Project is our interviewee this time and the work there is really exciting and some of it's quite different. Uh, I'm just going to check with Alex whether other people are getting an echo. Uh, or Lisa, am I, are you hearing an echo? Somewhat of an echo, not too bad. Yeah, okay. I'm getting a tiny bit of an echo. Um, can any of the attendees confirm if they're getting an echo as well? That would mean up. that you need to either put your hand up or send us a little message in chat. And that okay. echoing seems to have stopped. We've got a okay. couple of hands up. Yeah. Um, I'm not hearing it anymore. I think we're okay now. I'm not sure what that was. Okay, so. Um, this is the third in four sessions we're doing this year. It's the first of our free sessions around um, community mobilising, community participation and community leadership. And the reason Collaboration for Impact have chosen to host these four is we know that for many collective impact practitioners, um, the piece around making sure there's genuine and deep citizen participation and community participation and what we mean by that is those people who are in this work are not as not as paid employees sitting there with an organizational mandate and a salary necessarily we're looking at how we involve people with lived experience how we involve the mums and dads how we involve the business owners how we involve those that are coming to this work um, without a professional service mandate uh, and how we do that in a way that is genuinely influential and builds leadership and ownership in local communities. So that's one of the things that is one of the really real strengths of the Lighthouse Project. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Lisa very soon but just a bit of background for those of you that don't know Collaboration for Impact well. Um, you will probably already know that nationally we play a role building capacity for individuals, uh, organisations and communities and systems leaders uh, to work in complexity and to do that collaboratively. And uh, Collaboration for Impact does that uh, through some pretty impressive leadership and a range of associates that work nationally on those on this work and I'm one of those associates and my name's Kate Simpson. Uh, we've got a learning program that runs throughout the year and that you've probably already noticed. This is the first webinar we've run for free because we realised or we wanted to test it. We wanted to test whether that was useful and important and the fact that it's a sellout suggests it is. So we're likely to do this every quarter. I think that's all for Collaboration for Impact now. I will stop and ask Lisa questions occasionally. But otherwise, I'm handing over to the fabulous Lisa McKenzie to tell us about the work of the Lighthouse Project. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I've been waiting with some trepidation, but also really looking forward to today and having a chance to share what we've learned on our um, long and often challenging journey. Like many of you, anyone involved in the work, I think we all understand that there's no one size fits all and there's no quick fixes. Uh, it's long, slow work that involves um, very much looking and thinking about your own in your own circumstances. 
So I hope that you can take learnings away from today, um, things that we've tried and tested, uh, things that have worked and haven't worked, but also I very much appreciate that your own experiences, your own setting will inevitably, invariably be different. So I guess you're always testing what I'm saying against your own circumstances in your own context. Kate's asked me to talk, um, as you know, about, about our journey in relation to um, our bringing our community along and mobilising our community. Um, we mobilised them because we had to, <laughs> because we, that was the best way to get the work done. Uh, we started formally in 2014. Uh, our work came, probably began in 2011 though. Um, there was a community forum organised by philanthropists, the Fairley Foundation. And at that forum, our community, uh, it was a point in time, I think, uh, the leadership in our community, cross sectors and agencies and government and, and broader community leadership, uh, took stock of where we're at. And I think there was a recognition at that point that we weren't doing as well as we could be. We came off the back of a drought. We had uh, a downturn in manufacturing. We had very high youth unemployment rates and there was consensus that uh, things weren't going as well as they should be. Um, in way of context, Shepparton is situated uh, in northern Victoria, uh, two or three hours north of Melbourne. And we, our local government area has got a population of around 60,000 and the city of Shepparton itself is around 35,000. So the context was that we'd, we're surrounded by um, agriculture and our manufacturing um, was in decline. We'd had a decade of drought, which had been devastating. And we were struggling at that point. But what we did have and what we've always had is a strong foundation of community. We decided that day the best thing we could do is focus on our children. Uh, when we heard in, put together, there were some of the figures that were uh, put together that day really highlighted for many people for the first time how um, children would have been struggling in our town because of the uh, high levels of unemployment and some of the issues around crime, domestic violence, housing, all the sorts of things that many of you would be aware of. So we Lisa, didn't have at that time. Yeah, go on. Lisa, can I ask you a quick question? When you say we, how did you start? Like who were the we who kicked this off? Yeah. From that meeting, actually, there was a, a, a four of us were tasked with the uh, job of going away and seeing what we could come up with, really. I was one of those mm -hmm. four people. Mm -hmm. When I say we, though, um, I was already um, a, a very, um, had a very heavy involvement in my community. And by we, I mean our community leadership. Um, so I was already very heavily engaged in, across many, across a number of sectors, if you like, but I guess in that community leadership piece, which is people who know and trust each other and have been tasked often to do that um, involuntary, uh, not involuntary, voluntary, but volunteer sort of work, paid, mm. unpaid, advocate yep. and act on behalf of the community. So I was participating already in that. And uh, the people who came around us were those people. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we set about thinking what what we could would most likely um, we could do at that point. We'd looked at Strive in the US. A collective impact was very new. The, the work had just come out of Stanford in 2011, so the same year, that first piece of work around it. But i had been fortunate that in many ways I'd seen the work, um, our, what I'd seen happen through the 80s and 90s around our environment sector in regional Victoria, in many ways, uh, was the used the essence of collective impact, but it wasn't called that. Um, land care, um, mm -hmm. rallying the troops around things like uh, salinity and climate change. So, I think there was already a a way of working that was understood by some of us, and also understood intuitively because it's the way of working often in community. Yeah. So, so that's we. Um, we, we we find in lots of collective impact initiatives, the early success depends on whether or not there's a history of collaboration. And that's one of the things you're pointing to. Uh, one, of the th one thing I should just mention, which I didn't at the beginning, was we'll be taking questions along the way. So audience members, you'll notice that there is a chat box um, or a chat 
space in um, the dashboard that you've got. And if you've got questions as we go, because there's so many people, we don't usually turn the microphones on and sometimes have had difficulty doing it when we have. And so what we're asking is that you just type in any questions you've got and either I'll ask them of Lisa as we go or we'll save them up and ask them at the end. Back to you, Lisa. And are we on the yeah, right so side, Lisa? Uh, I'll say yes. Great. So we, at that point, uh, decided that time was pressing, time was of the essence. Our young people weren't doing as well as they should. And what could we reasonably do while we tried to bring to full scale a collective impact initiative? And we uh, very much tried to adhere to the principles, but immediately started to see there was challenges with that. So we didn't have any money. And when we started to air some of the issues, we immediately saw that uh, many, many, many agencies, organisations, um, experts already working in the field who weren't didn't immediately see this as a solution. Mm -hmm. So yep. there in lay, lay a couple of challenges, but there were many others. We started to think about what we could reasonably do and uh, we noticed that in the schools, uh, many of our schools, there'd been a concentration of poverty. And there was what was known here as white flight, where we'd had um, a concentration of refugees and Aboriginal children and vulnerable children in some schools and a movement away from, by our middle classes from those schools. And what that had left was uh, less volunteering, little or no volunteering, and less people available to support uh, and wrap around those schools. Mm. So we started doing things um, in a low key community way by tapping our friends uh, and pointing this out and inviting them to participate in the schools in volunteering. And it really took off. We started to advocate and if you like, provide a voice for children um, in public life in our town and beyond. And so we engaged the media, we uh, talked to our social networks, we gave presentations in, in clubs and uh, universities um, and in and around our town. And what we found is the commentary and the issues really, really resonated with our community. And we found lots of people had been worried about children didn't know how to respond or, or engage around that. And I suppose what we started to see was that we were creating a vehicle for people to engage around their concerns about young people. And as it turned out, there were many. Uh, people were really worried. They had noticed that a, a fair number, a fair part of our community was struggling. While we do have, uh, we're very fortunate in that we do have a very viable community and a community where many people do well, we also have a significant part of our community that was struggling. And that part of the community we started to see uh, was isolated and marginalised. And people had recognised this, but they weren't, they perhaps didn't have the vehicles or the skill sets or the capacity or the, or the way of working, if you like, to engage around that. So what we did pretty early on uh, when we realised that we were hearing a lot from people who, uh, if you like, were experts about the people we were concerned about, but not the people themselves. And so we started something called what that we called a thousand conversations. And we asked a thousand people in our community how they thought children were faring. And we used that to really create our, our game plan. Uh, it was our call to action and it really uh, our rallying of the troops and lots of cliches. And that was the point that we were able to really um, clarify what we, our purpose and what we thought the issues were and they really start to hone our responses. So what we did uh, was we asked three women in our community who are very connected and engaged already, facilitators, and we sent them out with four questions. We asked them 
tell us what you think know to be most uh, important for raising happy, healthy children. Uh, what would it take for every young person in Greater Shepparton to thrive? Uh, what's working and not working? And um, what could we do and how? And those questions were asked of, what we did was we started, we asked those ladies to go. So sorry, and, just, sorry to interrupt. You just mentioned um, there were three things you were exploring and that there was a kind of funny, fuzzy bit of um, static over the last point you made. Sorry about that. It was really how they could contribute. Great. What's getting in the way currently and then how they can contribute. Great. So we asked uh, those three facilitators to gather uh, half a dozen, between six and ten of uh, people that they knew it could have been even their family members, people from their community, their neighbourhood, their work, uh, sporting club. So they started with uh, a group of people and they asked those questions in a facilitated discussion around kitchen table or around, uh, you know, a, a table at work, around at the pub or at the football club. And people really engaged very strongly. At that point, they were welcoming the opportunity to discuss their concerns. They felt they hadn't had the opportunity and they often said, thank you for asking. No one's ever asked and they were very appreciative of the opportunity to participate. And from there, it was really interesting that uh, people, it, it had multiple benefits. Uh, people uh, had the opportunity to air their concerns and, and converse and clarify their views. Those views were documented. And then we were able to, uh, if you like, activate people from there people said, look, I'm really interested in this and I want to put my hand up. We were able to capture um, people that have now been part of our journey for, for a few years now. And then they often then said, look, I think my football club would be interested in this. Uh, I think my play group would be interested in this. I think my um, primary school would be interested in this. We were able to get to our thousand people, which was fine, but I was a little bit worried that perhaps we just spoke to a whole lot of people like us. Uh, but as it turned out, and really interestingly, uh, we were able to get out to all corners of our community. We have a very diverse community. We have a large refugee population, which has been wonderful in recent years. We've had a, a huge influx of new arrivals into our community, bringing um, new verve and vigour. And we have a significant Aboriginal population, which is the uh, largest in country Victoria. And we have a very generally broad and diverse community of um, farmers, uh, middle class, a thriving business culture, so a whole lot of a, a very mixed community. And they really wanted to have their say and participate. So interestingly, we did manage to get to all parts of the community without really having to go out too much and track them down and target them. What and what was the strangest place someone had a conversation? Uh, and, were, and were there questions around public liability and risk, or was it a pretty straightforward thing? Because this is um, it's a really interesting model, the kind of pyramid selling of hosting conversations in the normal parts of people's lives. It was very much in their own settings. So it was wherever they gathered, we went to where they gathered. So I guess the liability was their own. We were in their home, their church, their uh, football club, their uh, school. And our facilit facilitators actually we paid, they were uh, independent people, had their own ABN, so again they were looking after themselves. But the, I, I guess what they liked is we came to them and I get what we found was an enormous consensus in our community around, I thought we'd get very varied responses, but actually most people thought much the same things around what was needed for to support our children. and. Mm -hmm. The process was very interesting for the people who participated, many of them children, young people themselves, um, 14 years and over participated. Uh, and they had strong views and they wanted to be part of the solutions, many of them, which was very heartening. So the whole process was in itself community building and in itself yeah. very heartening and raised immediately uh, the profile of children in our community and how much we were thinking about children and, and engaging around children. And I had, um, I'm looking at some of the questions that are coming through, Lisa, and 
there's a couple that are, are useful to us now because they go back to the we. Who who is the original we? And so, mm -hmm. what was it? Um, you spoke about the four of you that were tasked, but who were you working for? How many of the people at the very outset were there just as interested citizens? Who were the we? Yeah. And I guess it's a little bit nebulous. I, I personally have a history of starting not quite this big, but other community initiatives in our community and being party to that. And often uh, the bound where it works really well is when the boundaries are a bit blurred. So yeah. uh, the we was a, a, a leader from within a university, a leader from within in a LEN, which is a uh, coordinating body for uh, for people not in Victoria. It's a coordinating body around. Um, uh, tr transitions to work and study myself. So it was people who uh, were, were tasked with starting the conversation. Who were you working for at the time? Mm. I was the executive officer of, officer of our community foundation and our board uh, recognised the value in this and gave me a lot of uh, space to do this and in many ways over time we became the mini backbone before we were able to establish our own backbone. So essentially uh, that organisation um, really was that very formative backbone in that um, we did agendas and minutes um, and we started to sort of become that, you know, central place, that keeper of the knowledge, if you like. So quite a, a fairly uh, fluid process. We were fortunate pretty early on to get funding from philanthropy and we were very fortunate in the type of philanthropic funding we received. Um, we received it from Equity Foundation and Perpetual Foundation, Equity Trustees and the Perpetual Foundation. And what they gave us was scope, uh, space, and um, a lot of flexibility in our funding. And that proved enormously beneficial. So over time, I was able to transition in 2014 to a paid role. And uh, when I talk about we, I also talk about very early on the community leaders who put their hand up, um, you know, I guess in a, a quiet way to stand beside this work, stand alongside it and stand behind it. And so we had the backing and it, it, it was pretty apparent early on that um, unbeknownst to me that carving out a space in this very busy space actually would um, inevitably um, cause some pushback or step on toes or challenge the status quo, which is we wouldn't exist. Yeah. We didn't exist to join the existing yeah. paradigm and status quo. We, we were disruptors and we were seeking to disrupt. But in doing that, you know, naturally in a relatively small community, there's pushback and things. And so what we found, there was a, an inner core of people, and they might have been 20 perhaps, who said, we believe in this work and we will be relentlessly supportive. And I think it was just so important. I could not uh, stress. And what they had in our community, um, probably half a dozen of those people had very high standing and reputations, a sort of a bit beyond reproach in terms of their commitment to the community and their values and how they've conducted themselves um, over time in our community. And, and I guess that held that space in a way that is so difficult early on when you're really trying to carve out a, a niche, if you like. So one thing I think might be useful as you continue to travel through your presentation is, um, if, it, if it makes sense, is to paint a picture occasionally of, of one of those leaders or one of those community members because I think one of the strengths of Shepparton is, for example, the involvement of the business community. Um, and I'm assuming that some of those six people with outstanding reputations are coming from that background and are seen as leaders outside the kind of social change space. Very much. Uh, yes and no. They've always been leaders uh, who, or they've emerged over time, I guess, as leaders by consistently doing the right thing, advocating on behalf mm. of our community have their mm. own significant social capital to burn, if you like, or willing to mm -hmm. expend, uh, have connections um, within our town in various, all levels of our town often, or across, connect, across groups, across organisations, clubs, uh, age groups, and then have connection uh, beyond the town. 
so that um, we were fortunate to have some people who had understood government and had access to government, who understood, um, if you like, the way, how to get things done, doers, how to make things happen. And they really had connections across sectors, so across, often across, um, across multiple sectors and had a track record of successful advocacy for our for our community. Someone that comes to mind, Ross McPherson, uh, he's an individual who uh, was an early, we have a company limited by Grand Chi as our board. He has been on there since its inception. He owns a significant number of newspapers in our region, so he's very well known and well established. He has had a big track record in um, outstanding community leadership on, on big issues, um, including, you know, addressing uh, um, our, our water usage in the area. So really big pieces of work involving state and federal government, engaging with philanthropy, and he's mm -hmm. the chair of a foundation, the GV Health Foundation for us. So people who had already a strong track record and a deep understanding of how to make things happen, and the sort of how to engage at all levels of community, government, philanthropy, um, and, and what, it, what it takes in terms of, I think the piece I often see lacking in discussion about collective impact is that personal leadership and that willingness yeah. to personally stand up and advocate and, and lead in a, uh, if not charismatic way, a sort of a, a change leadership uh, way that involves mm -hmm. um, personal commitment, personal sacrifice and, yeah. and a, commitment, a commitment to change and, yeah, and, and really brave and bold and catalytic. Yeah, and you put that beautifully and I think um, the other thing that this work points to is the diversity of people doing that with this work in Shepparton um, because it is a really interesting mix. Uh, so there's people who can work across a range of different sectors as individuals, but also as a group uh, in all sorts of ways. And it's really it's really interesting. Um, one thing, sorry, I should do another piece of housekeeping. I shouldn't have direct, directed people to the chat box. I should have directed them to the question box. And so we've got good questions coming through. And one of them was again about the wee stuff. So thank you for that. So I'll continue. So um, going back to the thousand conversations and I guess the context, we had these community leaders, we had a board and we had, if you like, a coalition of the willing. We, we went where the appetite was. So we didn't seek, at that point we realised there was not much point in trying to um, coerce, that people either were ready, there was a readiness, there was a will or there wasn't. We went where the will was and uh, we found that in uh, actually a lot of will, but it was generally in the broader community. So it was generally amongst our business community, our community leadership, our sporting leaders, our, uh, our middle class, so our professionals from all walks of life. We found it less at that point in the service sector and in the, um, the will of the agencies who are often competing in a very com very competitive and tightly held market here. And so there was less appetite at that point. We thought we would start by doing what we could reasonably achieve in the spaces that we could find. We set 18 priority areas from the 1,000 con conversations and those things that came out were around basic needs, we found things like food security, housing, safety were real concerns. We found uh, social isolation, a lack of connection and, and marginalisation were really big issues. We found a lot of the services were very much crisis driven and that people were looking for, if you like, the social fabric and the connections and the engagement that would hold and support a child in the community before they fell into crisis. Mm, we, yeah. found, we found that it takes a village and that uh, people understood that, but there was perhaps not, when you're fortunate and you're in a family that was supporting you, you're in a network of friends and neighbours, you have played sport or music or art, participate in music or art, there was, uh, that was in droves. It was very evident many children were thriving and doing re really well. But there was a whole raft of children who uh, weren't so fortunate and they were really falling through the cracks. 
So, so Lisa, we when, we, when we talked about this earlier, and, and if I'm interrupting you in the wrong spot, ignore okay. this, but you, you, you said something really interesting um, about this, which was you did a bit of a check around being sure that you were reaching um, a really diverse cross-section of the community and that there was rigour behind this that allowed you to be confident about that. Would you like to say something about that? Yeah, so we collected demographic information as we went. So every um, everyone who participated in the thousand conversations was given um, so a form to fill out that or work was filled out on their behalf, and they provided basic information about you know gender and levels of education, and um, they actually many of them provided their email addresses that allowed us to participate to, for them to engage and participate with us in an ongoing way. But by checking, um, we checked about the cold community, we checked around the level of participation by our Aboriginal community, we checked around things like do people have access to the internet or secure housing. And in doing that, we were able to ascertain um, whether they had children, didn't have children, etc. And doing that, we're able to ascertain that we felt that we had really accessed um, all parts of our community um, from our most engaged and connected and wealthy often members of our community right through to our most vulnerable members of the community. So we took heart from that and um, people sometimes say how are, you, how are you getting the lived voice in the room and the lived experience? Well we're doing it constantly. We've just done our thousand conversations again in 2018 and so now we've spoken to 2,000 people and they're with us everywhere we go and um, we we pull out continually the quotes, the commentary and the analysis from those conversations and use them to inform our decisions every single day um, in, in the office and in every meeting we're in. So it's something that you take with you to every meeting and it's actually uh, gives you a bit of a mandate if you like because when people say why are you doing that or whose authority are you doing that on what basis have you made that decision, you're able to say well on the best advice. We've asked thousands of members in our community and this is what they told us they needed. And what they told us they needed was often different to what we'd heard they'd needed from people who had been um, perhaps in paid positions supporting, supporting them. So often we heard that um, we needed more case managers or more, um, uh, more money for agencies, but often what the people said they needed was actually we needed back up the top of the cliff so we weren't falling over the cliff and then needing to access services. So it, it seems simple but it was a fundamental difference. So How a did lot you manage the data? Uh, well we collected the data um, um, manually if you like so on spreadsheets and then collated it um, and pulled it together on powerpoints and pulled it together in reports wow. that we presented to our board and yeah, so in, um, I guess uh, manually in that we gathered all of the commentary, we hand, they hand wrote as they went. So participating in the conversations, mm. the facilitator wrote down what they were hearing and yep. then transcribed that and summarised that into um, from each, from each uh, conversation and then they collated that together and brought that together in common themes. And we have, we've got a question here about um, the extent to which kids were involved in the conversations. Yeah, so in the first time around, they were certainly involved. Um, I can't remember the exact percentage and I'm just looking, I've got some information here and I can't see the exact percentage. But in 2018, the one that we've just done, uh, here it is, we had in 2015, um, Sorry, I'm just checking. We we significantly increased the number of young people involved in the conversation, and uh, I'm just trying to find that figure. I can't find it. I'm sorry. Someone's handing it to me. Um, the numbers increased. Um, we in 2018 we were able to access 24% um, of the people we accessed were children. Um, well, by children aged between 14 and 24. And so we, it's a significant portion that we we're able to access um, and we did that through families. So it might have been a big group, um, a club. They might have participated at a football club. We might have spoken to their junior players, for example. 
uh, through schools this time we accessed a lot um, by speaking to to whole groups of students. Brilliant. So and, and, and we're still on the right slide, Lisa. We could. The slide that we're on talks about the information that came out very strongly in 2018. Yeah. Social connection came out very strongly again. That need for access of role models, mentors, um, people who were able to give everyone a hand up, um, some work experience, assist with basic information. Sometimes people, kids talked a lot about information and access to information and getting the right information and they're worried about that. They talked about transport, so in our community that was a big issue. Um, they talked about employment, education, mental health and the overall image of our town which like many rural areas struggles. So they're some of the big ticket items. Um, they also talked about the role of good parenting in providing that foundation. But if I had to say what joins it all up in many ways, again, it's connection. Connection mm -hmm. to your school and to, to significant teachers. Connections that give you an opportunity for employment. Uh, connections to sustain you, um, hopefully before you find yourself um, with a diagnosed mental health issue because, because of loneliness and isolation, for example. Um, and connection around transport. So again, those issues um, will possibly resonate with many communities, but they've come out very strongly and, and they'll really very much inform what we're doing along with all of our other work. We're, mm. we're obviously looking at a lot of data and a lot of research as well. Mm. Brilliant. So we've pulled together 1,400 publicly available data sets and put them on a platform in our community. Uh, where we're also rigorously having a look at trends and looking for new learnings and at the same and looking at, at how that aligns with our thousand conversations we're using local insights and knowledge to interrogate what we're seeing and then we're looking for best practice and research obviously from around the world like many of you would be to bring new learnings and new opportunities to our community um, there's a couple of questions just around how you got the resources to do it so you mentioned that there was some philanthropic support was it a simple um, was it a simple case of uh, getting seed funding for the three facilitators to kick off the work? Was it a hugely expensive thing through this model of kind of trickle down conversations? How did that happen? We were, we were fortunate in that we put in that small first group, um, the four of us. We were given from the Fairly Foundation uh, a relatively small amount of money, and from memory. I think thousand dollars to have someone write don't quote me on that but I think it was five thousand dollars to have someone write a grant for us so we engaged mm -hmm. a professional grant writer and mm -hmm. she we we helped and we provided information and we informed that but essentially she pulled that together and from there we were able to secure a very substantial amount of funding a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year uh, that's been ongoing from that funder so that really kick-started us uh, so that enabled me to be employed uh, it enabled the thousand conversations to take place and it enabled um, us to employ a part-time volunteer coordinator and that's probably the other part of our mobilization that what we discovered was many of the people who took part in a thousand conversations and many of the people that we we knew personally in business and community were willing to put their hand up to help and so it was not out of the question to get phone calls from people saying, look, I've got 50 staff and I'm, how would you, I'll make them available to you. How would you like to use them? Wow. So, That's really yeah. Nice. We could go to the next slide and it shows that uh, we have, I think, uh, 400 volunteers now. And they're working. <laughs> yeah. So they're working across 21 settings, primary schools, preschools, secondary schools and alternative settings. We uh, have six. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Just one of the things you mentioned okay. before was schools with low volunteering rates. And when we were talking before this webinar, you gave the example, I think, of one of the schools you were working with where there either wasn't any parents involved or there was only one in the whole school as a volunteer. And um, that painted a pretty powerful picture. Yeah, so I remember speaking with the principal and asking, going, we looked at the figures, the levels of um, social of, of disadvantage in schools based on, you know, national sort of figures and things, my school and so on. And 
visited some of the schools that we'd identified as most vulnerable. And in speaking to one of the principals, I remember him saying to me, look, we only have probably one, one parent that I could call a regular volunteer. And so they, uh, most of the schools really opened, opened their doors to us and, and welcomed the people. And the people that we brought to them tended to be, it's a generalisation, but they tended to be uh, highly skilled. They were often professionals middle-class people, they might have been a scientist or an engineer or a lawyer, um, someone who worked in uh, an accountant. So a lot of those professional services put their hands up. We have a strong history of volunteering in our community, but not tapping into this group. And they were a latent resource in our community that, that we found was very ready to be activated. That's fantastic. Mm. So we have uh, about 60 partnerships. Many of those are with business. We've also tapped into uh, those leaders and sectors and agencies and education and, and our big sort of government and semi-government authorities, things like hospitals and water and so on, who have a lot of resources and a lot of expertise around uh, data or logistics. Uh, many of those resources uh, are, have been lacking or under, under um, sort of underutilised in, in the areas and spaces mm -hmm. we're looking in the community sector. And we've been able to activate those to provide new insights as well. So we've put uh, 60 community leaders on five collaborative leadership tables and they're wow. providing that expertise, the insight. So they're, they're reviewing our thousand conversations, they're reviewing our strategy, they're reviewing our data and we're tasking them with those that real uh, we're really trying to transition uh, the, the power and decision making to them around what they believe will most uh, support the needs of our young people but we're finding enormous resources there when we talk about uh, work experience they open up dozens of, of um, work experience opportunities because they might be in an organization that employs a couple of thousand people and is really underdoing work experience. And so the opportunities just on the tables themselves are quite extraordinary. Yeah, we're doing I, a lot of things. Again when, we, um, <laughs> again, when we were talking beforehand, you you said that one of the business leaders had said to you, um, why are there all these kids hanging out in the mall, but I can't actually hire anyone? And I, one of the beauties of this work is the bridging that gap. And it's 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 so interesting the way you've created those opportunities. Um, around we found five, a lot of. Sorry, Lisa, go. Our work is really around bridging, facilitating, enabling. We find a lot of the resources exist within our community, but haven't been fully utilised. Mm. Uh, perhaps a quarter to a half of our children aren't currently participating in work experience because those they've all of the organisations haven't been fully activated and we don't have a, a fully functioning um, work experience program across the schools. Mm. There's many examples we find like that. Um, we've found that many young people weren't transitioning to university because they couldn't afford it. So we've, as you can see from the slide, we've um, developed a scholarship program, we've got, we've, which we um, raised about $100,000 last year and gave it out in $5,000 scholarship. So there's, there's, there's the will, there's the capacity, and there's the local insight and knowledge. And when you bring a framework and a backbone, and I prefer to think of it now as a social innovation hub rather than a backbone, but when you bring those skill sets, we have internally a strategy people and a data person and um, leadership and alignment. When you bring that, um, you, can, you can put any wicked problems in there bring the local insights and then look for those local solutions. And I think the solutions don't always lie where we expect them to. And if we're open-minded about where those solutions are, I think that's that's a real learning for us, that um, they may not lie in the traditional places and where, and, and I think that's really around sometimes shifting the power around mm -hmm. back to the people who haven't said to us, we're broken and we need to be fixed. What they've said is a whole series of, often um, things that are beyond my control, my children don't get to play sport or participate in, in music because uh, we, we're unemployed, because we've had, um, like much of the Western world, a shift in, in um, you know, from manufacturing. We, yeah. 
perhaps have a mental health problem and, and able to provide the social connections for our child. So I think it's shifting it away from saying there's a part of our community that's damaged or broken and needs fixing to sh and, and is a client to more yeah. naturally parts of our community will fall on hard times, but collectively as our community will raise them up together and use all of our latent resources and the skill sets that we all have to, to make that happen. One of the things I found very interesting in the getting ready for this webinar with you was the conversation we had around language we often use in collective impact and I and I use and I will probably continue to use in some settings but more carefully was around lived experience because you offered up a challenge around the kind of them and us view of how we describe some things and that you have intentionally avoided that. Um, and, and really put the emphasis on what we as a community are aspiring to and how we as a community are moving forward. Yeah, well, if we think of us as one, uh, it's not them and us. And we all, everyone on our table has been a child or raised children or as a grandparent, is an employee, employer or an employee, has fallen on hard times themselves. We do have some people with what would in the sector be called lived experience. They might be they might be an Aboriginal person or they might be a person from poverty. But I think um, plonking people uh, perhaps out of context and, and uh, out of their comfort zone and expecting them to represent whole part, parts of our uh, community is not that helpful for anyone. So we prefer to use our thousand conversations and to uh, bring that to every conversation we have and we actually pull out and I even pulled out some for you today if I needed to use them but we pull out the voices and we talk about them in context. We also go out and have many other conversations. We spoke to 85 children who had fallen through the cracks and were very disengaged from everything uh, from school so teenagers who dropped out of school. We continue to do those consultations We've opened a haven and we've got uh, a couple of hundred of often very vulnerable and disengaged young people going there. If I want to check in uh, and our tables want to check in, we can go there and talk firsthand to those children about what they need. So I think, yeah, yeah I've, I've noticed that language and Lovely. I think it's more helpful to think about our whole community and, and how our whole community can use all of its resources and think about from that, uh, what are the assets of the people who are vulnerable and, and, and what have they, what do they bring to our equation? We need a bigger workforce here. So rather than think of them as people with a mental health problem or a drug addiction, I'd prefer to think of them as like Reese, you know, uh, employees um, are still awaiting activation. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, also, I think we talk a lot about family and um, I notice sometimes that makes people uncomfortable. We talk about love too, and yeah. uh, we think that how as a community. You, how do you talk about love? We talk about love a lot at the Haven, and if anyone wanted to have a look at our Facebook site, there's a video on there um, where the children, very unprompted, have talked about love and about family and about connection, and the extent that the Haven mm -hmm. provides that for them. They want what everyone wants. Um, they want their basic needs met, so we feed a lot of children there. Uh, they want to feel safe, mm -hmm. and it's a safe place. And then they want deep connections. So not nine to five connections, but connections that are, are about genuine caring um, and mm -hmm. deep connections that um, go beyond a, um, a service delivery relationship. Those things are very important still, and a very important part of our community, which we highly value. But there's another piece of work which is around that family-like support. So we talk about the head, heart, hands. Which is the head work is this what I've been describing, the data, the analysis. Uh, the hands is our volunteers and the people on our tables who are activated. And the heart is it's the big, it's the most important part of the work. It takes heart to stand up uh, and carve out a space in a um, very competitive market. To, be, to cause a disruption and to say that our community believes it can do better for its children and it's willing to go out of its comfort zone to do that and to go above and beyond its, its everyday work to do that. So it's a way of working, I think, and it's around really bringing that family-like support to every child so that we hope through our programs they might, for example, have 
uh, they might attend a breakfast program, they might uh, have a, a literacy mentor, they might uh, get a scholarship, they might participate at the Haven, they might get some work experience uh, or a mentor or a role model. Yeah. At every point in their lives, children have a connection that will uh, hopefully shift the data, but also mm -hmm. shift their well-being and, and their sense of belonging and feeling valued and recognised. I think children need to be seen and um, yeah. we need to be able to, to see the, their needs and address those needs. And if we think in that, bringing that whole family-like setting out to our wider community. Yeah, lovely, thank you. you can and just, I'm a reminder to participants, <laughs> yeah, just a reminder for participants, we've got, um, Lisa's gonna be talking for probably another 15 minutes before we go into some of the remaining questions. Um, you are passionate, Lisa, and it's really beautiful to hear. Um, and I'm enjoying the, the layers of this. I, I love the fact that um, the word love is being used and that, that, that we're in the heart space, particularly in some of this work, but there's real rigour around it. Um, I, some of the questions that have come up, um, and you can choose whether now is the right time to respond or whether you want to leave it till later, are also around if if people listening to this wanted to host their own series of a thousand conversations, what what sorts of resources do they need? You mentioned you know you're there and you'd hired someone part time. How long would it take? How much? How many human resources do you need? Um, to, to ensure that you've got the, the, the foundations or the infrastructure to hold this? For um, a thousand people in our community, it roughly takes about three months and three people working um, fairly consistently in lining up, attending and participating and then coming back and writing them up. So we're now in a position, our backbone, our social innovation hub has grown and we're now in a position where we've got those people in house who've done that this time around. But the first yep. time around, they were in our community, people who were um, community workers, if you like, who we paid as consultants to go and do that. Um, I can't remember exactly the hours, but essentially working pretty consistently by running a few sessions each week. It took about 100 conversations this time. So essentially mm -hmm. around about 10 people at each conversation and about 100 conversations. So yeah, dividing so that you're by not three. Talking, yeah, you're not talking... About, Sorry, Sorry. Um, you're not talking three full-time positions, but you're you're talking um, a person, three people hosting, say, two or three conversations a week. Yeah, so if they're doing about thirty conversations each, roughly uh, thirty-five conversations each, and then spreading that out over, you know, they sometimes before work, um, over lunch at a business place, on the weekend at a church or a club. So I think there's some flexibility required. And then there's the coming back and writing it up and then drawing out those conclusions and writing up those conclusions and looking for the learnings from it. And then applying the local analysis and saying, well, where are the gaps? Can we yep. encourage what's already in that space? Do we need to create something new in that space? Could we advocate or, or lobby for something from government to fill that space? Mm -hmm. So we take those learnings and we, we look for solutions um, ideally solutions within our community from existing resources but we're required what additional resources do we need and often it's an alignment piece it's a it's an advocating or lobbying or, or seeking commitment around a change and we're doing that more and more just seeking that the will to change current practices or we might go to um, an organization and then they'll say yeah look you know we, it's true, we haven't really done much work experience and we should be doing more. And we say, well, we'll facilitate that for you. Or we might go to a school and they say, well, look, we've got this group of um, people that we're, the group of kids we're pretty worried about. They're quite disadvantaged, they're quite isolated and we think they're going to disengage pretty quickly. And we might put in a custom designed uh, piece around that. So we're capturing a lot of data as we go and we're getting a lot of evidence that those things are working. We're looking for things, those early indicators like school attendance, um, improvements in literacy and so on and we're getting those changes so we know that in many cases we're on the right track but we're also refining all the time. If, um, if people are wanting to go down this path and I, 
Do you feel comfortable sharing the questions that you're using at the moment as a kind of lessons learned along the way starting place for people? Yeah, for sure. I can talk um, specifically about those questions, but I can also email, I can provide things to you that you could email out if you like. The questions this time were slightly different. The questions we asked were, tell me what you know to be important for raising happy, healthy children and go on to study, work and lead productive lives. What would it take for every young person to thrive in Greater Shepherd and Community? What do you think gets in the way and what action do you think is most urgent? Because we were looking at looking for that those change pieces, if you like. Yeah. And so that, someone, they trigger one, the discussion. One of the participants asked about how you found the balance between uh, in the in the conversations between the positive and the negative and how to avoid getting too bogged down in the negative and they're really interesting questions that you've got this time around around finding that balance. I think Could we're you looking for solutions. Looking yeah, tell me what you know to be important for raising happy, healthy children who do well at school and go on to study work and lead productive lives. What would it take for every young person to thrive in Greater Shepparton? What do you think gets in the way? And what action do you think is most urgent? Yeah. Um, they're actually right. framed to, to find solutions and yeah. to find assets, if you like, within our community and assets that people know, uh, the assets required to support a child, a strong family, a strong neighbourhood, um, mm -hmm. access and opportunity. Beautiful. So we use uh, we use the data, we analyse the data, and we interrogate it. And then our and then our tables are really now responsible with coming up with those solutions, and they're really starting to come forward. Uh, we found that there's five tables. What are what are yeah. how are they different? What are they uh, each responsible for? They're age based. So we have a youth table of young people, and then we have a table around early years primary age, um, secondary age, school age children and transition to work and study. So we've got a mix on those of um, lived experience, if you like, uh, experts, um, leaders and activators and um, people with the specific skill sets and knowledge and then access. We're really looking for people who have a lot of resources behind them. So they might be the HR manager of an organisation, they might be the data manager of an organisation, um, they might be in charge of um, procurement. So we're really looking for opportunities for partnerships and alignment uh, to bring those resources to bear uh, for our young people, particularly those who lack that social capital or, or aren't given everything they need to make their own way. Fantastic. And I think, yeah, sometimes those can be a bit unlikely. Some of them are, are, they're just those people who are deeply embedded in the community and know how it works and know how to make things happen. We're, we're really looking for doers. We're not looking so much for, um, we're not there to pontificate and we're not looking for, they're not advisory tables. They're really there to lead the change and to show that heart and to be champions. And uh, we have lost a few, not many, but I've, we've lost a few and, and, you know, and it may be that they, they're not in a position at the moment to, to, be, to be that champion, but we're, we're really looking to, um, for them to demonstrate that personal leadership in this space. So uh, not to advise us on what we should be doing, but to actually lead the charge themselves. And, and from what I understand, what you've said is that the Thousand Conversations has been really or has been one of the key strategies in identifying some of those people? Yeah, so many of them were activated by the conversations and said, look, this is really interesting. I want to be a part of it. So yeah. we captured those voices. They might have been, um, many of them have been volunteering along the way or they've made, allowed their staff to volunteer in business hours. We've had, we have a lot of businesses um, free up their staff during business hours to participate. Uh, 
just this week, we've had um, a water authority run a program for about 60 kids in one of our schools running a big incident control where all the kids played all the roles and, and learned about jobs in the process. We had business people today going into a school where they um, talked about their life journey and their challenges and then how they've overcome hardship. So we have many, and I think we've moved to that slide now. You'll see some of our partners there, some funders. The National Australia Bank, as an example, um, has volunteers in numeracy at a high school, has volunteers at the Haven. People just give us things. They give us old computers, they give us skills, they give us access to their networks, they give us money. I think money is absolutely important, but it's really the access and access to their networks and their skills and, and their leverage that's most important. That is a really extraordinary slide. That is a very diverse um, group of organisations involved. Really interesting. Thank you yeah, for sharing. Yeah, so there's funders there, there's um, partners, there's uh, some of the places that we where we engage. There's, uh, there's, there's agencies that might give us money, give us volunteers, uh, but give us their expertise around a particular issue or conundrum. Uh, they might um, they might provide insight in strategic planning or data. So there's it's uh, it's thinking about how to capitalise on all of the resources within a community. I'm very fortunate in that we've got quite a large and well-resourced community. But I think even in the smallest communities, there is a local bakery and a local often a local bank or a local post office. It's starting with where there is some skill, some capacity, and uh, some some sort of existing, if you like, um, a workforce or some or some uh, latent resources, and I think they do exist in every community at the football club, um, in the small businesses in the town. So we are fortunate, but I also think this model is transferable. Fantastic! It's really. Yeah, that's a, and many collect, collective impact initiatives would have something similar, but we often don't put them together quite as beautifully as this. So that that diversity, because I can see there's schools, there's um, state government departments, there's local government, there's service providers, there's definitely employers, there's industry bodies. It's a really interesting mix. Yeah, and it's about relationships. All of everything we do is based on these are our actual friends. They're not uh, they're not people we work with. They're, in all of those organisations, uh, we would consider them our friends. That we're they are committed to us personally, and they're committed to us organisationally, and then they're committed to the people we serve. So I think again, it's it's relationship based, and it's on the quality and calibre of those relationship and the people that we're engaging with that is essentially any success we have is a result of that. Um, we're also doing something in schools where we're linking industry into schools and we've engaged with about 500 students so far this year and we're taking kids out into the community and they're, they're finding those engagements really powerful in understanding just how life is and how, how, things, how to make things happen and how to, how to be successful. What are those elements of a successful life? Uh, if you if you're not taught those, or if you're not role model those, um, how do you get exposure to that? And I think that in many ways that's what we're seeking to do to provide children with those entry points and the understanding of what those elements of a successful life are. Uh, it's not to say they they may not need more specialist services and things down the track or at different times in their lives, but uh, it's a precursor this this foundation work that we think is really important in our community. Yeah. It, when you talk about relationships, you're not just talking about relationships of people in leadership um, and the backbone team or amongst leaders being catalysts. It's you're building the relationships across the community in all sorts of ways. Well, if you think about the Haven, there's a couple of hundred kids come there. Those mm. kids uh, who may be from a family that um, it's, they're very, they all vary, but it's possible they're from a family some really significant issues, perhaps around domestic violence or drugs or alcohol or long-term unemployment and so on. Those kids now actually all know, every one of them knows a bank manager, a lawyer, an engineer, 
because they're there every day and they all know each other's name and they're all engaging around the things that they're interested in cooking or board games or and they uh, and then that's flowing on to opportunities and access where they're given part-time work or they're given um, you know opportunities to engage with the business or they're given new life skills training or they're given uh, just it's really access to role models so it's it's quite when we talk about lived experience uh, we are engaging every day with the lived experience and every CEO in our town pretty much now is either uh, playing billiards down at our haven or reading uh, sitting on the floor reading somewhere in one of our schools they all know an Aboriginal child. They all know a refugee. They all know someone whose kids haven't been as fortunate as their own. And they're coming to us every day with new solutions. They're coming to us all the time saying, look, I've been thinking, we have, why don't we have a book drive at work? Why don't, we've got some old computers, do you need those? I'd like to do some training. These kids don't seem to know how to get a part-time job. I'd like to give some coaching around that and I'll set up a program around it. So it's a very fluid thing as well and people are identifying themselves as having that capacity their organisation to be able to bring those resources to bear. You know, it's that whole take the village thing and people stepping in where they need to. So Lisa, um, we've got quite a few questions coming through. I'm wondering whether um, it now is the time to begin to go through them or whether you had more you wanted to share before we do that. No, that's a pretty good start. I uh, could talk all day. I guess I yeah. the only thing I'd say is that we have a community strategy now that, we're, um, that we've put together that tries to capture all of this and this way of working and our intentions for young people and the data that we're seeking to address and we're seeking the buy-in. So it is all of this, everything I've described is captured in an overarching community, um, in an overarching community um, strategy that everyone can buy into. And if you'd like to move to the next slides, I think some of those photos show, just show the ways of working and the way people are engaging in our community. Well, we can perhaps look That's at the slides while, while we answer the conversations. So Lisa, which one are you first? <laughs> uh, on that slide, down the bottom, in the middle in the black dress is me. Yeah. Hello, Lisa. And who else can we see here? Tell us a bit about um, the people in this. The bottom right is the uh, Chancellor of La Trobe University, John Dewar, with some of our scholarship recipients that we do in partnership with the Community Fund. Uh, the top right is going right back actually, but that was one of our early um, engagements around setting our agenda. Uh, the top left is um, a mentoring program at one of our schools with some um, children at risk of disengaging. Uh, the bottom left is, I think at the library, our literacy tutors engage on a visit to a library with um, some of our students from Shepparton High School. And the middle, uh, top middle is Anne Sexton, who was one of our uh, facilitators of our first conversations in 2015. Beautiful. Thank That's you. a little vignette and, and you'll see there's a number of other slides that show similar sorts of engagement you know you can probably guess the sorts of engagements perhaps that that from the from the following slides well let i'll just i'll go through them and if there's anything you want to mention um what are we doing with sheep hmm. that was this week yeah. that's a group of children from gary street primary school who uh, perhaps have where there's relatively poor attendance and fairly high risk of engagement due to children with um, from a fairly disadvantaged background. I don't want to stigmatise our children, they're great kids, but that would describe them. And they would went out to a farm with, with their mentors from their Rotary Club that they engaged with every week. And they learned about sheep and they had a campfire and they uh, had a great day out on a farm, which many of them strangely hadn't been to. So again, yeah. it's living and learning if you like. Um, top right is a game this week and it's um, the incident control room that I described earlier with young people learning about all the jobs that come into for when there's a crisis. Mm. Uh, the middle is our, is, yeah, so the middle is our literacy program, uh, the bottom is kids from uh, bottom left is a literacy program and the top left is 
some pretty vulnerable kids from our haven engaging with several uh, cabinet members of, of our um, state cabinet, telling them about their needs at a regional assembly. So I'm going to go on to the next slide, but one of the questions that's come through that some of these slides are beginning to answer, but you may want to comment on, is you heard that one of the real things people wanted to see improve is um, social connection or social cohesion. How have you built that into your planning and your responses? I hope that in some ways everything I'm describing um, reflects that. It's a way of working and thinking. It's bringing all parts of our community together in unexpected ways. It's using those resources to build relationships at a grassroots level. So all of these kids can now say, slide, that's some business leaders in the top left. And kids from the Haven, that's a bank doing a fundraiser, kids having their breakfast program, and some kids on the right, bottom right there at the Haven. They're all engaging at a grassroots level we actually all know each other's names and we can see each other. And that seems doesn't seem remarkable, but that wasn't the case necessarily with this group and this mix of people. So they all speak to each other at the supermarket. They could ring up in the future and uh, get uh, put a phone call through to a CEO. They could get some work experience. They could get um, an opportunity that they may not otherwise have had. So I guess that's what I'm talking about, that social connection that improves the social fabric across groups and across perhaps unlikely connections that are I think improves our town for everyone. So we do focus a lot on the marginal or the disadvantaged, lots of tags. I would contend that everyone on that top left of that um, slide is far better off for having participated in Lighthouse and they will tell you, I, I know for a fact that if I asked any of those people they would consider it a very important significant part of their life that has led to improvements in their own well-being and their own workplace and they often say it's the best part of their week so I think um, it's it's tangible things it's the volunteering it's the connections it's the activities it's the engagement it's it's building the fabric where it's perhaps uh, was, be, was becoming a little bit thin or frayed between parts of our community. Thank you. Um, some of the other questions that are coming up are around um, community members on leadership tables. Uh, so I'm gonna to go to the next slide so that we get to see all these fabulous images and, and also ask a question. Um, so how do you decide who gets to be on the community leadership tables? And do you provide training for anyone so that they can participate actively? Yeah, uh, we put out ads through newspapers and Facebook and said, are you passionate? Are you a change leader? Are you ready to be a disruptor? Those sort of words. And we got mm -hmm. a whole raft of people coming forward. We got the right number of people. We were hoping for 50 adults and a table of kids. And, you know, this is the magic of the work. That's exactly what we got. The group is very diverse. It's... Uh, highly skilled and uh, represents a very broad cross-section of our community. There was one or two sort of agencies or sectors who felt they weren't represented and, and they approached us afterwards and we were able to place them. But essentially we took, it's a coalition of the willing, we took those who self-identified and came forward and we said, you're not there to represent your sector necessarily or the, you're the agents the agent. uh, looking to tap into their resources. You're really there for your own verve and vigour and your own capacity to, um, to challenge, to analyse, to lead and to, and to be part of that change. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so that, In terms of the professional development, I, I forgot to mention, but we've, we've given them change leadership um, training. We've mm -hmm. given them training in collective impact. We're continuing to give them, we've given them training in data and, and analysis. So we are providing them with a range of um, training and learning opportunities, shared learning opportunities, because we're building alignment on those tables. They're not, they're not fully aligned in, in some ways, you know, they're still emerging and we're building, they're continuing to build the sort of shared view and the consensus and the alignment. So, and the training opportunities really help with that. And that's basically being offered to everybody, regardless of where they come from or what sector or 
age or stage? Being a CEO for 20 years, whether they're a social worker in their first year of their role, uh, we're offering that to everyone. That's fantastic. Um, so the other questions, some of them are around back to the community conversations. Um, so one person asks, uh, I'm going to give you two questions and you can respond to both in any way you like. Um, is hope part of uh, the conversations with community is one question. And the other is, do you have a form that participants um, fill out to find out age, gender, or do you ask verbally? Yeah, um, hope is what we're all about. We're selling hope. That's our job. Um, we're a, you could even think of this, this whole thing as a marketing exercise and, and what we're selling is hope because I think we've had the assumption that we're getting a bit of feedback here. I'm sorry if you are. I think we've had the assumption that um, people can't be fixed and these solutions are, are so wicked they can't be solved and we actually believe for our community, we do have the solutions. And the whole exercise is exercise in hope and, and the whole conversations are based on hope. Uh, and the other part of the question was, yes, we do have demographic um, forms. People can fill them out themselves, but when there's low literacy or just when we sense that, we often go through the exercise together or someone else fills them out. So there's ways of doing that, but we're really looking to capture everyone's background there and people have been very willing to do that. Thank you very much. Um, we're fairly close to the end of the session. Um, we've got one more question and I'll just encourage participants if you've got any last questions to send them through right now. Um, Lisa, what process do your volunteers use when they identify kids in crisis to connect them with appropriate services? And I've realised I've forgotten uh, another service related question, so I'll give you that in a sec. That's okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we do do training. We do training, all sorts of um, pieces of training that are dedicated to, you know, whatever service it is. So, for example, um, some of our people dealing in schools with um, young people who are struggling with literacy and socialisation have been given training by speech therapists and that assists them in engaging and encouraging language development, as an example. Um, some of our literacies, um, Volunteers are given assistance around, you know, the, the manage, you know, engaging in a positive way around literacy and reading. Um, in terms at the workers at the Haven, where they're certainly a fair chance of engaging with children who have experienced, and if you're looking at the slides, uh, they're all photos from the Haven, and they're photos of paid and unpaid workers. I think all unpaid there, uh, engaging with the young people there. Um, certainly, we've them the tools there to help identify children potentially who have might divulge or have crisis and we actually have just put in place a triage worker we're calling them there and that's something someone who can identify we're not seeking to create those services ourselves but where we identify children in need we're seeking to address those needs uh, in a systematic way by connecting them with the appropriate services or supports so we're actually have moved to do that in quite a um and organise, you know, fashion because of the number of um, needs identified there. And we've received funding from a philanthropist to do that over the next couple of years to connect them to existing services within our community or create new opportunities to support them. Sometimes their basic needs aren't being met and they have to be addressed first. Um, and we seek to do that there by connecting them back to school, back to opportunity. Uh, and we're also... I'm sorry, Lisa. Continue. Okay. So providing hopefully the people there with those skill sets they need to have those conversations and to direct them people to people who can provide them more. We have counsellors there, so we have paid staff as, and, and so they we, they can be directed to people who have you know significant skill sets in the area. Um the final question I've got, um, and I'm really sorry about things flashing up on my um on my uh, screen because uh, my computer crashed and I borrowed something from someone else. So we've been dealing with all sorts of issues in the run up to this webinar, everybody, and I think we've done pretty well. Um, we have. So uh, someone asked, you mentioned at the beginning that originally services weren't um, early adopters in this space because it was a fairly competitive environment and they were 
the, the flexibility wasn't there for many of them. And one of the questions from the audience has been around uh, the extent to which services were, or agencies is their language, and I'm interpreting that as services and uh, as in um, funded service providers, either government or non-government, that um, the question is about the extent to which they were collaborating before this. And, and I think the question I'd add is, how has that changed as a result of this? Yeah, so I think there was a period where there wasn't a lot of collaboration. In fact, we did a, a social research piece on that and, and found that to be the case around that time. So that's going back um, a few years now, um, perhaps 2012 or 13. No, later than that, 2015, I'm sorry. So three or four years ago, we did a research piece around that and we found that to be the case. I would say that environment's changed a lot. I think we've had a role to play in that. I think we've had uh, some a bit of a change in the operating environment and the will. And so there's, uh, and I think government now funds more around collaboration, I think, for land. So I think there's a changing a prevailing view and operating environment. And I think we've contributed to that as well. So we now find many of those um, service sectors and agencies sitting on our collaborative tables, uh, seeking our involvement, and we're certainly seeking theirs. And so that environment is really improved and it, it's a quite a positive environment where we're seeing a lot more alignment on what the, the key issues are. And I've got to say, I see everywhere I go now, a commitment to deep listening. And I think that deep listening is at the heart of what we do. Deep listening and deep connection are essentially our theory of change. And uh, I like to think we've played a real role in embedding them in our community. And we had a forum here last week where they those very two issues emerged as, as really early years, deep listening, deep connection were, were the overarching themes that emerged from the day. And I think um, we've seen those thousand conversations undertaken around Quite a few places around now and I think it it forms the foundation of the work a really strong base to uh, and a strength from to from which to base your work so I think that's um that's certainly been a learning for us and it's it gives you the confidence and the integrity I think in the work so uh, yeah I'd encourage other people to think about deep, whatever form it might take in their community but to think about deep listening thank you um, I'm sure everybody that's participated in today's webinar would love to thank you very deeply, Lisa, for the generosity that you've given us in sharing this experience because it's really rich. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a lovely, flexible nimbleness in the thousand conversations. It sounds huge, but the way you've done it actually is something that um, looks from a distance to be relatively light, enjoyable, but built into it is the rigour that allows it to turn into influential voices of people from those communities, but also to surface um, uh, new, new actors in this space, activists and contributors, really exciting work and clearly very productive. The photos that we're looking at at the moment say it all as a product of what people were saying they wanted, particularly young people, safe places, connections, places to feel love. This is really powerful stuff. Um, so thank you very much. I think also the, the level of involvement from that diverse group of leaders that are rich in social capital and the direct connection between those leaders and young people is a really lovely piece of what I take away from this story. So thank you on behalf of Collaboration for Impact and also I'm sure the audience. Um, and I'd love to thank the audience for joining us uh, on this first free webinar. Um, as I mentioned, it's been a bit of a crazy morning for everybody involved in delivering this to you. So thank you also for any uh, patience with us for any glitchy bits. Um, but it, it's feeling like a really worthwhile experience to me. Uh, anything you'd like to close with, Lisa? Um, no, I think I'd say have a go. I think people you know there's a level of almost nervousness having a go but if you're listening and responding to voice you you almost can't go wrong 
and make a be bold and make a start and um, you know do something unexpected and and <laughs> forge ahead I guess I'd say because uh, we're wasting time I often think um, talking about the issues rather than talking about the solutions. With that in mind, what we will do after this event is, um, as registrants, you'll receive uh, a, a recording of this uh, webinar, and you'll also um, any any um, documentation Lisa shares will include. But you've got a copy of the presentation as a PDF as a handout here, and that's going to be probably the easiest way to download some of this. Um, and there will also be a survey from CFI, Collaboration for Impact, in that communication that we'd love your uh, response to because it will help us make sure that we're addressing the learning needs of the sector from here on. So thank you all very much. Um, looking forward to connecting again with all of you and a particular thanks again to you, Lisa. Thank you, Kate. I'm more than willing to take individual inquiries or to have offline conversations as well. If anyone's interested in contacting us, I'd be more than happy to uh, chat by phone or email and provide any support that we can for good work. Thank you. Fabulous. Fabulous. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Gone. I think they're gone. Right. This is the explode. Then you can get back at all your notes and comment. Or other things.